we are live now hello everyone welcome to you all to our uh, second series of let's talk primate organized by association of indian primatologists as we promised we come back with another set of interesting talks on life of some amazing primates around all over the world and the studies are witnessed and done by some well known scientists so today with us we have dr j b leka associated professor in the department of psychology at the university of lethbridge alberta canada and he is also a adjunct faculty with the school of natural and engineering science Na national institute of advanced studies bangalore india he preliminary study the model of acquisition and expression of modal less functional and sometimes arbitrary forms of object manipulation and non conceptive sexual behaviors which socially influence or learned and culturally maintained in several macaque species like japanese macaque rhesus macaque balinese long tail macaque and so on and even he is currently collaborating an ongoing study on indian macaque species bonnet rhesus and lion tail macaque he employ comparative longitudinal experimental and physiological approaches in in many research which has a multidisciplinary approach like of different discipline like psychology ethology anthropology ecology and endocrinology these approaches are significant because of the selective role of behavioral byproduct has received little attention among evolutionists thus his scholarly work contributes to offering a uh, pluralistic perspectives on darwin and evolution theory so now i'll request dr leka to take his mic and yeah, please enlighten us about his interesting behavior leka please all right. all right thank you very much well thanks very much arijit for this introduction um hello everyone it's such a pleasure to be with you today um let me just start by expressing my gratitude to the association of indian primatologists for their invitation and for giving me the opportunity to share my work with you all um so indeed i'll be talking today about the study of behavioral byproducts in primatology so let me just grab my laser pointer here and um yeah i'll be using some of these um examples of what i believe are evolutionary byproducts of um behavioral expression in in non-human primates more specifically in in macaques so here we have a form of object play called stone handling and uh, then i'll try to make a case about this behavior being a, um uh, this one a, a tool assisted genital stimulation and and one of my main points today will be to convince you that these two behaviors so object play and tool use uh, might be evolutionarily related and then keeping with this parallel between non adaptive and adaptive behaviors i'll continue with a second pair of behaviors this time within the domain of of sexual activities and more specifically non conceptive sex with um female male mounting here and female female mounting there so here's the outline of my talk first i'll provide some background information on um adaptations and byproducts with an emphasis on on behavioral phenotypes second um i explain that cultural primatologists study behaviors that can fall into the adaptation and, and byproduct categories third i'll actually use two of my research projects to illustrate my point that behavioral adaptations and byproducts are culturally maintained and can be linked together um to provide a, a more comprehensive picture of of behavioral evolution and finally i'll finish by returning to my talk title and i'll address the the who the how and the why of the study of behavioral byproducts in primatology so the objective of the this first section is is to provide some background information about adaptations and byproducts um with within the the realm of evolutionary biology or evolutionary psychology which means we'll touch on on some of the evolutionary processes including natural selection but not only and um a, a vivid illustration of of how views on evolutionary processes can be debated and sometimes fiercely debated actually 
um, within the scientific community had been presenting in, in this book by Kim Sterlney, um, Dawkins versus Gould, Survival of the Fetus. So, of, of course, there's, there's a play in words here, um, reference to Darwin's mechanism of natural selection. Uh, the point here is to remind you that some scholars like Dawkins have a strong adaptationist views and, and they consider evolution by means of natural selection um, as, as almost an, an algorithmic process. Whereas other scholars like Stephen Jay Gould have a more pluralistic view on evolutionary processes and, and, and products actually. Um, and this view includes of course, natural selection and adaptations, but not only. And um, we should not neglect the role of a variety of byproducts, spandrels, exaptations, when we think in terms of evolution of uh, anatomical, physiological phenotypes, but also behavioral and, and psychological uh, phenotypes. And well, instead of being too theoretical about evolutionary processes, byproducts, adaptations, um, let me illustrate my point by taking a specific example of a behavior that we humans use every day, language. And um, a few months ago, I was invited by the Department of Modern Languages and Linguistics uh, at the University of Lethbridge uh, to give a talk. And I, I actually chose this topic, how the human brain got language and what could stone tool making have to do with it? And well, to, to kind of put my audience at ease, um, I told them right from the start, well, you see, I'm not a neuroscientist and I, I don't study the brain. I'm, I'm not a linguist either. I, I don't study language. And at the risk of disappointing you, I'm no archaeologist either. So I actually know very little about the evolution of stone tool making. So why on earth would I decide to speak for one hour about this, this puzzling topic? Well, the answer to this question lies within the the hypothesized relationship between these two behaviors right there language production and and stone tool making all right so now to further my point let's let's break down the problem into its basic components and you'll see that this this little exercise will take us into a journey into the, um, the relevance of behavioral byproducts. All right, so let's say we have this hypothetical ancestral member of, of the, the hominin lineage. Maybe it's Homo erectus, maybe it's Homo habilis or Homo ergaster. It, it doesn't really matter. And now let's say that this guy produced some kind of vocal utterance. So, of course, it wouldn't be full-blown human language, but, you know, the, the precursor of it. Now, the main issue regarding the, the evolutionary origins of language is that we don't have a direct fossil record of it because this behavior did not leave physical traces behind. And one of the reasons is that most vocal organs are soft tissues that don't fossilize. Now, what we do have plenty of direct fossil record from this ancestral environment is stone tools and actually not any kind of stone tools. The Acheulean hand axe, like this one, which is you know, beautifully designed, pear-shaped, um, symmetrical tool that is very sharp on the edges. Now, how can this specific object provide us with any kind of information about the, the origins of language? Well, let's get a little bit closer to this stone tool and let's see if it can speak to us. All right. So Come on, come on, let's let's get a little bit closer. All right, there we go. It's telling us something. I'm a behavioral artifact. Now, this means this tool is part of the physical traces left behind by ancient minds that were thinking and maybe teaching themselves in such a way that they could produce such complex and, and efficient objects. So it's like it's like an external memory for the pa from the past. So um, if we can reverse engineer this tool and, and work like, you know, forensic scientists, just like detectives would, would work on, on a crime scene, well, we might be able to explore the links between language production and stone tool production. Now, let me give you um, a, a, a glimpse of, of what we can do with that. So even though I'm not a neuroscientist or linguist or an archaeologist, um, I'm interested in, in the possible evolutionary relationships between language and stone tool making because, uh, no, I'm, I'm not an architect either, but, you know, we, we're getting there. Um, 
I'm a spandrelist. So, and, and that's a spandrel right here. So I, I'll define this term in, in, in a few minutes. And guess what? A spandrel is also a name given to uh, some evolutionary byproducts. So the reason is, is that they, they actually require researchers to consider what they call internal constraints and, and opportunities of structures in, in living organisms. And well, the, the task we have in our hands is pretty daunting because the evolutionary origin of language is probably one of the most puzzling mysteries in, evolution, in human evolution. But still, let's, let's tackle it and, and see whether our understanding of stone tool making can help us with that. Now, as I told you, we, we don't really know for sure whether um, any of these hominin species could speak or not, with you know, the exception of um, this uh, species right there on the top right corner, which is our own species. But when scientists start asking themselves these kind of questions, what they do is they, they usually generate one or ideally a number of alternative hypotheses, and then they collect data to test them, right? So we simply call this the, the scientific method, and it tends to work quite well. Okay, so the, the issue we have with language and, and many other evolutionary puzzles actually, is that researchers can be broadly divided into two camps, two sides, with each side um, holding one type of story or hypothesis or approach. So on the one hand, we have the functionalist approach that considers language as an evolved adaptation. And the question here could boil down to, well, an adaptation for what? And, and these images right there are illustrations of answers that I, I'll present in, in, a, in a minute. And, and people like Richard Dawkins or, or the linguist and, and cognitive psychologist Steven Pinker generally fall into this side of the, the story. And then on the other hand, we have the structuralist approach, including people like Stephen Jay Gould, who tend to look at this question from the perspective of internal constraints, structural opportunities, and yes, byproducts. So for time's sake, uh, I'll actually spare you the long list and, and actually probably non-exhaustive list of functional hypotheses for the evolution of language, but this, this review paper provides a, an interesting sample. So for, for people in the first camp, the, the selectionists, uh, language can be viewed as an adaptation for, well, for, for what? All right, so first on the list, the, the grooming or gossiping hypothesis proposes that communication among early humans started literally through um, the expression of one-on-one uh, -on -one grooming interactions and, and as we see in uh, non-human primates actually. But then as human group sizes increased, there was a need for the selection of a more efficient means of communication to um, exchange information, including about non-present individuals. So beyond this initial stage of one-on-one -on -one grooming and language could have been that new medium of communication, this adaptation whose function was to increase um, social cohesion within larger groups of humans. And, and one of the major proponents of this grooming or gossiping hypothesis is the, the anthropologist and evolutionary psychologist, Robin Dunbar, who you may know him for a related concept, which is the, the so-called Dunbar's number. All right, then we have the, the hunting coordination hypothesis, um, whereby language is viewed as an adaptation for group hunting, which is an activity that requires coordination of complex, fast, risky collective activities, and language would have been selected to make group hunting more effective. Then we have the courtship hypothesis, according to which um, language um, evolved as an adaptation in response to pressures that are not necessarily related to natural selection in, in general, but more specifically related to sexual selection, because language would have um, allowed females to assess the fitness of males. And then we have the Mothery's hypothesis, according to which language evolved as an adaptation in the context of mother-child communication, and uh, more specifically with um, possibly sexist twist to it, actually, when, when mothers had to put down their babies to collect food efficiently, um, th their only option to calm down the babies um, was to use some form of vocal communication. 
and of course we could go on and on with with this list of hypotheses but um, I will end it here because this this approach is actually typical of the adaptationist program whose uh, proponents have been criticized for exactly that coming up with just so stories in some kind of a Panglossian view now this term comes from the French satire by Voltaire titled um, Candide after uh, the, the main character's name here uh, in which this um, Leibnizian philosopher named Pangloss right there um, served as, as Candide's mentor and teaching him about the world and, and actually kind of in, indoctrinating him with naively optimistic and sometimes um, outright false concepts um, such as uh, well observe that noses were made to wear spectacles and so we wear spectacles and and this uh, this mantra repeated by Pangloss and, and eventually criticized by Voltaire um, all is for the best in the best of all possible worlds all right now here we have um, two scholars Gould and, and Lewontin both evolutionary biologists who also criticized this view of the world and actually targeted more specifically the, the adaptationist program. Um, in, in this um, seminal paper titled The, the Spandrels of San Marco and, and the Panglossian Paradigm. Now, if we want to understand what um, byproducts are, it's, it's important to explain a little bit the, the first part of, of this seemingly enigmatic title, uh, The Spandrels of, of San Marco. And, and this is a relevant part of the, the Basilica of, of San Marco that Gould actually visited. Uh, and, and after admiring the, the beautiful dome and its, its round arches, he actually focused on, on these um, triangular spaces between the, the tops of two adjacent arches and the ceiling, which in, in architectural terminology are referred to as spandrels, technically speaking pendentives, but let's, let's stick to the, the spandrels term here. And, and when you look at, at, the, at the paintings right here that actually um, decorate these, these areas, it, it is quite tempting to think that these pendules are adaptations that emerged to serve the function of containing a painting that beautifully fits the, the, this tapering space. However, that's exactly the kind of just so stories you want to be extremely cautious about because the true story is that these spaces were not actually used until later on when artists realized that they could actually paint in these small areas whereby um, enhancing the, the overall design of the building. And that's quite a good illustration of the problem we have when dealing with adaptations versus byproducts in evolution. On the one hand, we have the arches that can be considered adaptations and whose function is to support the dome. And well, on the other hand, when, when you mount a dome on, on top of round arches, you automatically and necessarily generate these architectural byproducts, and, and they are called spandrels. And, and these are spaces left over between the tops of the arches, and there's, there's just no way around that. Now, even though these, these spandrels have um, no function uh, unto themselves, they are simply functionless byproducts of these adaptive arches, um, it could be that these, these spandrels um, end up having um, benefits uh, of, of some sort or, or appropriate uses um, as, as, as if it was the case for these, these spaces in the Basilica of San Marco with these, these paintings. Um, but we have to remember that these, these benefits are like bonuses. They are, they are secondary. They, they appeared later in time um, as, uh, and as such. They, they, they can't be called function because technically speaking, only adaptations have function. So they can only be called effects. So byproducts may have effects, but not functions. Now, if, if we go on a bit with, with our analogical reasoning here, let's replace these um, adaptive arches with this relatively simplistic illustration of, of some specific brain systems in, in humans. Well, arguably for evolutionary psychologists, these, these brain systems are adaptations whose function are, for example, to detect predators, find food or reproduce, all those um, fitness enhancing cognitive abilities. But just like the arches produce architectural spandrels, the construction of our brain systems also produces spaces left between them, 
and 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 we'll also call that spandrels cognitive spandrels and interestingly these cognitive spandrels constitute the most consensually accepted explanation for the evolutionary origins of religious belief or religious behavior even though you find many selectionists that will tell you that religion evolved as an adaptation for group cohesion, cooperation, or because it promotes individual health. Most scholars in, in, in the field of, of cognitive science of religion actually argue that religious belief evolved as a cognitive spandrel that is a, a functionless but potentially beneficial byproduct of some specific cognitive processes that were themselves adaptations but in context that had nothing to do with with the religious domain such as our adaptive ability to detect and sometimes over detect actually um, agents in in our in our environment and and that's adaptive because uh, you you want to be able to detect the very subtle presence of potential predators but when you tend to over detect them uh, well you can also make mistakes like inferring the presence of supernatural agents like spirits and, and gods. Now, back to our story. The, the cognitive ability to make complex stone tools was arguably a powerful adaptation for our human ancestors, but by evolving this capacity, could their brains have also given rise to another kind of cognitive spandrel, such as the ability to speak? Now, to answer this question, we, we need to have a deeper understanding of the evolutionary process of natural selection. Now, does natural selection only create adaptations like these beaks of Darwin's finches? Well, I hope I just convinced you that the answer is clearly no. By creating adaptations, natural selection automatically produces a bunch of spandrels or junk material, which is not necessarily a bad thing, as, as we'll see. Now, is, is natural selection an all-powerful engineer? Well, in, in, in this seminal paper, published some decades ago in the journal Science, the, the biologist François Jacob said absolutely not. And, and I'm, I'm quoting him here. Natural selection does not work as an engineer works. It works like a tinkerer, a tinkerer that does not know exactly what he's going to produce, but uses everything at his disposal to produce some kind of workable object. And a bit further down the paper, um, evolution does not produce novelties from scratch. It works uh, on what already exists, either transforming a system um, to give it new functions or combining several systems to produce a more elaborate one. Now, this is an example of uh, a Rube Goldberg machine um, whose function is, is to perform an apparently simple task through the, the activation of a series of related devices in a quite complicated way. So, in this case, the, the self-operating operating napkin, uh, when, when we view the machine in its entirety, could be considered um, an, an adaptation. But the machine itself uh, might be composed of a series of spandrels that necessarily emerged during the construction of, of the, the self-operating napkin. And now they are so inextricably linked to the adaptation that you can't separate the spandrels from the, the adaptation anymore. And um, as we know, such an evolutionary tinkering process exists at all the levels of organization uh, of any living organisms um, from their uh, genes to entire body plans um, with this example of variation around a body shape theme uh, in, in different species of starfishes, just like you have variation um, around a common melody in classical music and um, including tissues or organs um, with the, the well-known example of, of tinkering uh, in the process of the, the evolution of eyes uh, across animal taxa. Now, could there be tinkering around the evolution of this um, often called special organ that, that is the brain? And, and could brain mechanisms be subjected to evolutionary tinkering? Well, of course, the, the brain is not so special that it should be exempt of, of tinkering. And actually, Stephen Jay Gould argued that the human brain is exactly the place where we should expect a lot of tinkering to occur. And one of the main reasons is that we humans are cultural organisms. 
and, and according to this paper, our cultural landscape allows for the, the, the tinkering around or the, the recycling of cortical maps. So indeed, the, the neuronal recycling hypothesis proposes that cultural inventions can invade evolutionarily older brain circuits and inherit many of their structural constraints. So this process could explain the evolution of modern cultural behaviors like writing, doing math, or driving a car um, that our brain was clearly not originally designed to produce, but that would be a byproduct of pre-existing cognitive adaptations. And, and speaking of which, and again, adding to the list of byproducts after the spandrels, um, Stephen Jay Gould, and this time Elizabeth Verba in 1982, coined this new term in evolutionary biology, exaptation. So exaptations are initially unselected traits that are capable of being subsequently put to usage, sometimes a new usage, um, through a process of functional recycling of ancestral structures called co-optation. So an exaptation is a trait that is currently adaptive without being an adaptation. So we already knew we had, on the one hand, adaptations, on the other hand, spandrels. And now we know that an adaptation can be functionally recycled or co-opted into an exaptation, type 1. And likewise, a spandrel can be functionally recycled or co-opted into an exaptation, type 2. And um, these three types of structures are all evolutionary byproducts. And along with adaptations, they are all the products of natural selection, even though only adaptations are really selected for. And the typical example of exaptation in the evolutionary literature is the feather. So people generally believe that feathers evolved in birds as adaptations for flight. However, the, the true story, again, is, is that of a, a sequential process leading to both adaptations and byproducts. So now there's, there's substantial paleontological evidence to support the view that feathers were originally selected for thermal regulation in flightless ancestors of modern birds. And then they were later co-opted for sexual display as a first exaptation and eventually further co-opted for flight as a second exaptation. Now, back to language, tools, and brain with this fascinating paper by Greenfield, who argued that a, a common neural substrate located around Broca's area may underlie the hierarchical organization of elements during the early development of both the basic syntactic rules of speech, sentence formation, and the skills required to functionally combine objects manually, tool use, tool making. So in other words, the, the same brain structures would harbor two types of grammar, a linguistic one and another leading to tool oriented actions. And this intriguing idea was later supported by Colony and Edelman who proposed the cognitive coupling hypothesis whereby language evolution was facilitated by the cognitive exaptation or hijacking of existing brain mechanisms related to hierarchical planning and sequential motor execution, for example, stone tool making, um, and which came to be reused for new tasks while retaining their old use. So is natural selection an all powerful engineer? Well, the answer is no, it is not. Natural selection only tinkers. It recycles, it exacts with what's already available. Now, do we have a strong case for stone tool making instruction as a key facilitator of the emergence of language? Well, let me just take two disciplines among many others for which the answer to this question is, is clearly yes. First, cognitive psychology. So this series of drawings show you that the manufacture of complex stone tools, such as the Oshulian hand axe, uh, is a multi-stepped process that requires the performance of specific actions in a specific sequence. And basically, if you miss one step, you won't get a fully functional final product. And similarly, when we generate a sentence, like in this example, the angry bear chased the frightened little squirrel, and, and somehow I managed to find a photo of exactly that. Well, you, you go through 
also a multi-stepped process of thinking that requires the selection of specific words in a specific order and if you miss one step you won't get a fully understandable final product and that's exactly the point here so systematically chipping away at a rock and building a coherent sentence are both goal-directed hierarchically organized and sequential behaviors that require us to think several steps ahead somehow donald trump made it to my slideshow at this very moment but anyway let's let's keep going so both stone tool production and language production are complex, multi-stepped, hierarchically organized and goal-directed behavioral sequences that require action planning, foresight, and fine-grained perceptual motor coordination, skill. And the argument from neuroscience could be summarized as follows. So, as Homo erectus was learning to make increasingly sophisticated stone tools, such as the Acheulean hand axe, evolutionary changes in its brain could have paved the way for the evolution of language. And more specifically, we've known for a long time that Broca's area is involved in the production of language. And more recently, we learned that patients with damage to Broca's area develop not only a grammatic aphasia, so this cognitive disorder characterized by an impairment, in sentence formation. So in, in this situation, uh, they might be able to say the cat is chased by the dog, but if you reverse the drawings, they, they'll have trouble generating the new sentence. The dog is chased by the cat. Um, and they also develop uh, apraxia, characterized by the inability to use or to make uh, tools properly. So in both cases, there's a lack of uh, hierarchical organization, planning and execution of syntactic production, whether it's linguistic grammar or tool-oriented action grammar. Now, even if we buy into such a structuralist approach to the evolution of language, the questions remain, what is the behavioral adaptation? What is the behavioral byproduct? Is it language or is it stone tool making? So if we assume that stone tool making was the adaptation and it appeared first, that means it would have subsequently led to language as a behavioral byproduct through some kind of neutral drift in our ancestral brain mechanisms. And in this view, language would be either a spandrel or a co-opted adaptation, but regardless, both are behavioral byproducts. And if we take it the other way around, that is, if we assume that language was a byproduct or spandrel of some other adaptations and it appeared first, that means it could have given rise to the adaptive stone tool making through some kind of um, exaptive emergence. And then stone tool making would be considered a co-opted spandrel or exaptation. But I would say, regardless of the direction in which this process actually occurred, what is important here to understand is that adaptations and byproducts are inextricably coupled. They function in tandem. So try to uh, keep this flowchart in, in mind because um, it will be the thread of the rest of my, my talk today. And my point throughout this presentation is to emphasize that adaptations and byproducts should really be viewed as two sides of the same evolutionary coin and we can't fully understand one without considering the other. So again, it doesn't really matter whether language or stone tool making appeared first, it's pretty much a chicken and egg story. What matters the most is that stone tool making and language probably co-evolved within a mutually beneficial cognitive package and ancestral humans first basic conversation was possibly about how to make your own stone tools as part of some instructional learning or rudimentary verbal teaching. And the first part of my talk was an illustration of two chapters on evolutionary byproducts and byproducts of adaptations that I just published in the Encyclopedia of Evolutionary Psychological Science. 
And to prepare these two review chapters, I contacted Martin Linde Medina, who recently proposed a, an extended taxonomy of non-fitness, as, as it's uh, illustrated in this flowchart, um, where you can see that adaptations are here and pretty much everything else can be considered evolutionary byproducts of some sorts, um, like uh, spandrels there and exaptations there and you find a bunch of other types of byproducts depending on your position on, on this decision tree. So, um, uh, for example, if you, you may find that um, some traits don't lead to any significant changes in, in fitness, um, but they may still produce some, some proximate benefits that we call utility or bonuses. So try to remember this term for a little bit later into the talk. Um, or other traits uh, may actually lead to a decrease in, in the fitness of their bearers. And in, in this case, you might be dealing with uh, what we call maladaptive traits. And, and of course, that doesn't mean that true adaptations don't exist in primates. They do exist, and actually they, they exist in, in various phenotypic domains. Uh, they are well-known morphological adaptations, physiological ones, behavioral adaptations, and psychological adaptations, but they are certainly not ubiquitous, and, and we have to be careful to not over-infer adaptations and see them everywhere at the risk of leaving almost no room for evolutionary byproducts. And by the way, it's interesting to notice that in this review article by Dora Biro and colleagues, they documented a number of examples of tool use across a range of animal taxa, including primates, cetaceans, birds. Um, but instead of boldly stating that every form of tool use was an adaptation, they cautiously reminded us that while the question of adaptation is undeniably key to understanding the emergence of tool use behaviors, empirical data on the adaptive significance of tool use are surprisingly scarce. And the reasons for this are likely rooted in the difficulties associated with obtaining the required long-term field data on tool use performance and reproductive success. So let's not take behavioral adaptations for granted and let's leave some room for behavioral byproducts even in places where adaptationist interpretations seem intuitive all right now in this second part of my talk i will of course keep on focusing on behavioral adaptations and byproducts um, and to do so i will use a key component of my own research program, cultural primatology. And for the past almost 20 years, uh, I've been studying cultural behaviors in non-human primates. And again, my journey into the world of cultural primatology led me to consider both behavioral adaptations and behavioral byproducts. And, and, and by and large, uh, traditional behavioral research, including classical ethology, has focused on species-typical behavior patterns, like courtship and agonistic displays, as illustrated here, whereas behavioral variation between groups of the same species has long been considered to be noise of little intrinsic uh, interest. Well, however, there is um, growing evidence for substantial geographic variation among conspecific groups of various animal taxa and actually in a wide range of behavioral domains including well actually um, courtship displays but also food choices um, foraging techniques uh, communication signals um, anti-predatory responses and even um, mutualistic um, interactions and, and such intergroup differences in behavior are generally explained in terms of ecological, genetic, or cultural factors, or most likely a combination of, of these causes. And, and interestingly, intergroup comparison um, can sometimes uh, provide clearer insights into the causes of behavioral differentiation than um, interspecies comparisons. 
because um, groups or populations have often been separated for less time than have um, species and they tend to differ in fewer characteristics than do species. Um, so this may allow us to reduce the effect of um, confounding variables when you know, tracing back possible uh, behavioral precursors and discussing evolutionary scenarios about step-by-step -step changes in, in behavior. So clearly, um, research on intergroup variation in behavior has key implications for our understanding of behavioral evolution and, and general evolutionary patterns and processes, including um, byproducts. And, and in, in this regard, non-human primates are excellent study subjects for at least two reasons. First, uh, we know that many primate taxa, prosimians, monkeys, great apes, um, exhibit high levels of intergroup behavioral diversity. And second, of course, uh, their um, phylogenetic relatedness to humans makes them prime models for um, human behavioral evolution. And over the past 20 years, um, the, the systematic study of intergroup behavioral variation in non-human primates has produced valuable empirical data um, that are um, used to uh, test predictions and fit models um, that are generated from theories about the role of cultural processes in human evolution. For example, uh, this research by um, Andrew Whiten and colleagues uh, charts cultural variation in different types of behavior and across different chimpanzee communities in, in Africa. And, and so this, this relatively new and, and exciting field often referred to as cultural primatology or the study of behavioral traditions in primates aims to examine the ecological, genetic and socio-demographic influences on behavioral variation among groups of the same primate species. Now, what kind of cultural behaviors are being uh, studied in, in non-human primates? Well, generally um, behaviors that are considered adaptive, uh, including activities that are related to subsistence, such as uh, tool-assisted foraging techniques. So here's a first example, um, tool-assisted ant dipping behavior in, in chimpanzees. And this behavior is um, present in three these three communities, uh, and it is absent in these other three communities without any obvious uh, ecological or, or genetic uh, explanations. And, and likewise, um, tool-assisted uh, nutcracking behavior, another adaptive foraging technique, is um, present in these two communities and it's uh, absent in these uh, four communities. Even though uh, in these um, two communities right there, um, there might be local ecological reasons for, for the absence of um, the behavior. Now, if we take the example of the, the hand clasp grooming behavior, which is a form of greeting interaction between two partners, possibly testing their social bonds, uh, the argument about subsistence is, is not there anymore. And um, well, even though this behavior may offer some, some social benefits, it's probably more a behavioral byproduct than, than a true uh, adaptation. And, and this behavior is uh, present in these three communities and absent in these three communities. And for sure, this time, uh, it's, it's hard to imagine any obvious ecological or genetic factors that could explain this, uh, this intergroup variation. So we are definitely dealing with uh, a cultural behavior here. And here, oh, I, I really like this one. Um, here's another example of um, behavior that is not really explained in terms of, of natural selection, that's for sure. Uh, this, uh, this chimp right here in, from a, a wildlife sanctuary in, in Zambia picked up a, a grass stem and inserted it into its um, ear canal and, and it's, it's letting it 
hang from there and it's uh, the chimp is going about with his uh, this activity and this this grass in ear behavior is is actually not idiosyncratic and it has spread socially across the majority of this group as as you can see in 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 these pictures and here and 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 there and, and the authors um, wrote about this phenomenon, chimpanzees have a tendency to copy each other's behavior, even when the adaptive value of the behavior is presumably absent. Well, I'm arguing that they are dealing here with a causally opaque, arbitrary, and, and questionably adaptive cultural behavior that has the hallmarks of uh, a behavioral byproduct. So, as, as you can imagine by now, when it comes to intergroup variation in behavior within a primate species, um, I think it's, it's equally informative to focus on behavioral adaptations, but also byproducts. And I'll put the emphasis, obviously, on, on the latter in, in the rest of my talk. Now, let me unpack this for you. All right, so let's do it. Number one, it has been argued that questionably adaptive behaviors, possibly by products, such as the, the non-instrumental manipulation of objects or object play, can still allow uh, an individual to um, gain information about the, the properties of these objects and gain practice, leading to an increase in manipulative skills. And, and this form of affordance learning may have given rise through exaptive emergence to instrumental object manipulation or um, tool use, so probably a, a behavioral adaptation. So in short, uh, perception action routines in, in non-functional contexts like object play would, would kind of buy you um, knowledge and, and practice that could be co-opted into possibilities for action in, in functional contexts such as tool use. Number two, behavioral adaptations such as uh, heterosexual copulation or conceptive sex leading to reproduction and, and fitness uh, outputs could lead through a form of neutral drift to behavioral byproducts, uh, such as those observed um, in, in the domain of non-conceptive sexual activities, like the well-known female-female um, GG genital genital rubbing in, in bonobos. And so again, the, the main point of my talk is to make sure everyone understands that behavioral adaptations and byproducts are equally informative from an evolutionary standpoint because they work in tandem and, and you can't fully understand one without considering the other. So number three, behavioral byproducts are of course uh, less functionally constrained than, than adaptations, um, which allows for more flexible and arbitrary behavior patterns to emerge. Uh, and one example of that is the hand clasp grooming behavior in chimps with different behavioral variants, such as uh, the palm to palm, the wrist to wrist kind of uh, um, positions uh, that were studied by uh, Nakamura and Uehara. Um, and um, another example is, is these different forms of social greetings in, in wild, uh, white faced capuchin monkeys in Costa Rica. The, the hand sniffing, the eyeball poking, and the finger in mouth kind of games that have been studied by Susan Perry and, and colleagues for many, many years. Um, now, number four, we know that uh, behavioral arbitrariness uh, is usually a function of individual experience, um, but it can also be influenced uh, culturally through social interactions with other group members. And, and finally, number five, the lack of fitness consequences and the arbitrariness of behavioral byproducts make it easier to rule out obvious ecological and genetic factors and then further examine um, cultural factors as, as uh, potential causes of uh, intergroup differences. And, and 
just in case you feel the need for another example of flexible and arbitrary behavioral byproducts of cultural evolution, but this time in, in human primates, um, let's, let's remain within, within the realm of, of greeting conventions. Um, in, in North America, people tend to hug. Uh, in Western Europe, people tend to uh, shake hands and uh, Donald Trump again. Um, and, and in Japan, people tend to bow. So, overall, research on intergroup variation in behavioral byproducts can truly expand our understanding of biological, that is Darwinian, but also cultural evolution and the variety of behavioral patterns that it produces, including those with no obvious survival and reproductive values. So, once again, behavioral byproducts are important. Which leads me to my, my own and main research interests. Um, as you may have understood at this point, my research program focuses on the mechanisms, the hows, the evolution, the whys of arbitrary, culturally maintained, and questionably adaptive behavior patterns. Hence, the title of my talk today, Studying Behavioral Byproducts in Primatology. Now, in the first part of this third section, I'll present some empirical evidence for object plane macaques as a cultural behavioral byproduct. And I won't focus on, on this, where's my pointer, this um, behavior here, eye covering play, even though um, Noel Gunst and I are, are drafting a manuscript about it. Instead, I'll talk about this behavior, stone handling, which was at the core of my first postdoctoral research with um, Mike Huffman. So, sternening in Japanese macaques is a form of solitary, versatile, sequential, non-instrumental, arbitrary, and playful manipulation of stones. So you have to imagine a monkey performing a sequence of stone-directed but functionless actions, uh, going, for example, from pickup to sniff, to cuddle, then carry, gather, scatter, rub a bunch of stones on the surface, rub them together, and clack two stones together. And, and this stone handling activity is, is generally performed by many or most individuals from all age and sex classes, so clearly not only juveniles, but adults and even old adults can keep on playing with stones, which makes stone handling one of the, the very few object play activity in, in non-human animals that continues um, well into adulthood. And Noel Gunst, Mike Huffman and I provided several pieces of evidence that stone handling is a form of object play culture in Japanese macaques. So number one, stone handling behavior is geographically variable in its frequency and form. And in some groups, it is habitual, in others, it is rare, and in others, it is absent. And, and these intergroup differences in stone handling are not explained by obvious ecological or genetic factors. Number two, stone handling behavior starts in a group of Japanese macaques as an innovation. It requires an inventor. And... Um, in the free-ranging group of uh, Arashiyama around Kyoto City in central Japan, the innovator was this uh, juvenile female right there. And actually Mike Huffman um, actually photographed her on the very first day when she started playing with a bunch of stones. Number three, stone handling is socially learned either directly through observational learning from uh, stone handling demonstrators both um, horizontally among peer playmates uh, and then vertically from mothers to offspring, as, as reported by um, Charmali Nahalagi. And it's also learned socially um, indirectly through indirect social learning um, via behavioral artifacts defined as the physical traces left in the environment 
um, by a stone handler, such as this pile of stones gathered by um, this uh, monkey. And, and Noel and I conducted field experiments, and we found that stone handling artifacts can trigger stone handling activity by naive monkeys significantly more often than randomly scattered stones. So these uh, play stations, like, like this one, um, that are found everywhere in, in the monkey's cultural landscape are easier starting points that prompt uh, stone handling activity, even in the absence of any stone handling performers. And number four, stone handling is cumulatively transmitted and transformed across generations of monkeys. So this graph shows the number of um, new stone handling behavior patterns recorded in the Arashiyama group of Japanese macaques over three decades, right there, uh, with the, the first group of data uh, being collected in the 80s and 90s by Mike Huffman, and the second group of data being collected by Noel and myself uh, in the years um, 2000. And as you can see, we found an increase in diversity and complexity of um, stone handling actions over time, with more complex actions in black and blue here uh, that tended to be um, performed and actually to emerge later in time, which is kind of reminiscent of a process of cumulative cultural evolution. Now, can stone handling be considered a behavioral byproduct? Well, because stone handling is a form of object play, um, the evolution of this behavior, like other play behaviors, can be explained from two broad angles that I described at the beginning of the talk. First, adaptationist hypothesis proposed that stone handling could serve the function of either training the sensory motor coordination of the player during development, or preparing the player for unexpected situations that may be encountered later in life. And second, the byproduct hypothesis tend to view stone handling as either an incidental side effect of surplus energy or a functionless spandrel of potentially adaptive but hyperactive motivational systems in the brain that are linked to arousal or, or reward. So, as you can imagine, because stone handling is at least immediately non-functional, in other words, the stones are not used by the monkeys as physical agents to achieve an obvious goal, and, and stone handling seems to be an arbitrary behavior in the sense that there's no possible mistake in, in gathering stones rather than rubbing them on the ground or carrying them around. Indeed, the performance of, of these uh, behavior patterns appear at least on the surface, to be determined by um, impulse, uh, whim, or maybe just chance, rather than necessity or, or reason. So, as you can imagine, in the rest of my talk, I will treat stone handling as a behavioral byproduct. And, and one way to test this byproduct hypothesis for stone handling is to take a close look at um, our behavioral data and, and see whether we find cases in which stone handling appears to be a functionless spandrel of adaptive but hyperactive um, arousal or reward systems or uh, a built-in reservoir of stone-directed behavioral uh, variability or if it has this exaptive potential to be later co-opted for the fitness enhancing usage of stone tool use. So we're back to this slide that I showed you before. And the question here is, do we have any evidence that stone handling, this, this form of object play, um, that would be a spandrel of possibly adaptive motivational processes, do we have evidence that stone handling can lead through exaptive emergence to uh, the behavioral adaptation of stone tool use? Well, I'm going to present three elements of answer in favor of a yes uh, to this question. So number one, in this paper, we argued that a uniquely functional stone handling behavior pattern, stone throwing, could have emerged from a behavioral repertoire of overwhelmingly functionless but culturally maintained stone handling activity. So we focused on a captive group of Japanese macaques that were housed in an enclosure at the Primate Research Institute in Japan. And it's important to note that 
This group of monkeys showed the, the highest stone handling diversity and stone handling complexity of all our study groups, if, if you remember the map that I showed you a couple of minutes ago. And interestingly, after several months of observation of regular non-functional stone handling activity in this group, we noticed the appearance of this particular stone handling behavior pattern in one of the group members. And so we continued our observations of this group and within a couple of months we found out that the stone throwing behavior had spread within the group roughly following social affiliation pathways. But more importantly for our question, this behavior was significantly more often performed during contexts of disturbance related vigilance like the, the sound, the, the noise of a loud aircraft flying above the, the enclosure as you may have heard from the video. Then any other behavioral contexts, including regular stone handling. And we provided um, some evidence that stone throwing served the function of increasing the effect of agonistic displays. In other words, when a monkey was aroused, it would start by um, shaking the metallic structures in the enclosure, as any wild monkey would shake branches in a tree. And then the monkey would pick up a stone and throw it up in the air, and this conspicuous behavior was, was quite attention-getting for other monkeys nearby. Well, arguably, that's an example of stone tool use in a, in a social context. So we argued that we could have a case of stone handling as a behavioral spandrel of some brain systems associated with you know, playful, um, pleasurable reward, because regular stone handling is object play, leading through exaptive emergence to adaptive stone tool use in a social context. So here, stone throwing as, a, as an enhanced agonistic display. And so this new behavior would be a co-opted spandrel or exaptation type two. Number two, now to give you uh, this second example of possible transformation of stone play into stone tool use, uh, let's explore a second macaque species in which stone handling occurs. Uh, my former master student, Amanda, documented the entire stone handling repertoire of Balinese long tailed macaques, and she found that this behavior shared many similarities with stone handling in Japanese macaques. In other words, the, the, the huge majority of the, the stone handling behavior patterns also fit the definition of a solitary, versatile, sequential, non-instrumental, arbitrary, and playful manipulation of stones that were also performed by individuals from all age and sex classes. Now, how do we know that stone handling in long tail macaques is also a form of object play, like in Japanese macaques? Well, Amanda and I worked with Sergio Pellis and Vivian Pellis, who are two experts in the mechanisms and evolution of play behavior, but also experts in movement analysis. And together, we did a comparative, structural, and more specifically, uh, kinematic analysis called Eshkol Walkman movement notation, which takes into account the, the relative positions of different body segments. And we used this technique to compare two types of percussive actions performed by long tail macaques. First, stone pounding, that consists of repeatedly pounding a stone on the ground for uh, no other apparent reason than playing or maybe producing a sound. And second, net pounding, which is arguably uh, an extractive foraging behavior. And uh, we found significantly more structural variability in stone pounding than in net pounding, which indicates that stone pounding is not pseudo foraging, but a distinctly motivated playful action. And uh, just like in Japanese macaques, stone handling in long tail macaques is also a form of object play culture, which is geographically uh, variable. For example, we only observed um, stone handling in this population of um, free ranging 
um, long-tailed macaques living in Ubud, Central Bali, and not in these um, other populations of uh, also free-ranging long-tailed macaques living in, in similar uh, environmental conditions. And my PhD student, Camilla, followed up on this study by focusing on a particular stone handling behavior pattern called tap on groin, or TOG, that's performed by both males and females. And here's a video to illustrate this behavior, and I seem to remember that it's, it's a male on the video. Now, as you may imagine, we hypothesized that tap on groin could be a form of stone-assisted genital stimulation, or to find an, an analog in humans, a form of masturbation with sex toys. So this means we could have a second case of stone handling being co-opted into stone tool use again, but this time not in a social context, but in a sexual context. Now to test this hypothesis, Camilla went through two analytical steps. First, in this graph, she compared the duration of different stone handling behavior patterns performed by male long tail macaques, depending on whether or not they experienced penile erection during their stone handling sequence. And she found that um, tap on groin was the only stone and link behavioral element that lasted significantly longer in stone and link sequences featuring penile erection than in stone and link sequences without penile erection. <clears throat> and, and second, uh, in collaboration with an Italian colleague, Maurizio Casarubia, she used a technique called T-pattern analysis that explores the detailed temporal structure of behavioral sequences, including different types of behavioral elements like stone handling. And this comparative graph also focuses on males, and it shows that stone handling sequences that did not include tap on groin were more structurally variable and thus potentially less functionally constrained than stone handling sequences that did include tap on groin. And uh, these were less, um, significantly less uh, structurally variable and thus potentially more functionally constrained. And that's exactly the kind of difference that you would expect when you use a structure function interface to test differences between object play behavior and tool use. So here again, back to our uh, recurrent uh, mini flowchart, uh, we could have another transformation um, of stone handling as a behavioral spandrel into a form of stone tool use, stone assisted masturbation, as a co-opted spandrel or exaptation type two. And number three, even though I don't have uh, statistically informed results to show you for this one. Camilla and our field research assistants have been using field experiments this time to test whether uh, certain stone link behavior patterns could be co-opted into stone tool use again, but this time in a, in a foraging context. And to do so, we focused on two specific um, stone handling behavior patterns. First, stone pounding, which I defined a few minutes ago, and uh, stone dropping that consists in picking up a stone and dropping it inside a cavity or a hollow object like this uh, plastic bottle, and then getting the stone back and dropping it again and again, like, like a game. So to test whether each of these two playful stone directed actions could be co-opted into a functional stone tool use behavior, we built two puzzle boxes in, in transparent plexiglass that each requires uh, exactly the performance of the corresponding action to be solved. In other words, to solve the, the pounding box here on, on the left and, and get access to the, the highly prized food reward, which is 
a raw egg that's visible through uh, the walls of the box. The monkeys uh, should use the stones that they usually play with uh, this time as hammers, as tools to break the, the break the, the the plastic lid on on top of the box and then retrieve the food. And to solve the dropping puzzle box on the right here, the monkeys should insert uh, a relatively heavy stone into the pipe on on top of the box and that will collapse the platform inside the box and release the, the, the food reward. So the good news is that um, several uh, stone players were able to transition from um, stone play to stone to use. And now Camilla is analyzing the data to test the predictions that individuals who often perform stone pounding in a playful context will come up with the, the stone pounding to use solution faster than other stone players. And on the other hand, individuals who often perform stone dropping in a playful context will come up with uh, the, the stone dropping to use solution faster than other stone players, because uh, that's exactly what you would expect under the, the stone affordance learning hypothesis. And to wrap up this section on stone play and stone tool use behaviors. I'd like to briefly mention that with my colleague Afra Farood, who's also an expert in movement analysis, including lab and movement analysis, um, we are co-supervising a master student, Sydney, on a puzzling type of object manipulation that might exist in our sternling macaques, and that would be object-directed fidgeting-like behavior patterns, possibly triggered by specific attentional or motivational states during some environmental contexts, such as locally stressful conditions. And I'd say, uh, well, regardless of Sydney's results, um, that whether or not there's a form of uh, object-directed fidgeting in macaques, this study has the potential to better understand behavioral byproducts, again, because object-directed fidgeting is this type of uh, object manipulation that seems to have these um, arbitrary, quirky, causally opaque, and uh, generally functionless um, components to it. Now, in this last section, um, I'm going to switch behaviors of interest completely, but I'll keep the thread of my um, evolutionary relationships between behavioral adaptations and byproducts. So the studies I'll briefly present here are based on a research program on, on non-conceptive sex that was initiated several years ago by Paul Vasey and that uh, Noel Gunst and I joined as postdoc fellows in, um, that was in 2011. And the three of us are, are still collaborating on, on a number of projects related to this, uh, this field. So I won't have time to talk about uh, masturbation behavior or male-male uh, sexual uh, mounting behavior here, um, which, which are two behaviors that, that we, we study. But instead, I'll focus on two apparently related forms of female sexual mounting behavior, female male mounting and female female mounting. So let's start with a simple but puzzling fact stated in, in this review uh, article by Paul Vasey. Uh, in certain populations of Japanese macaques, adult females exhibit bisexual behavior. They routinely mount both adult females and adult males. Now, when, when Noel and I started our collaboration with Paul, we told him that we were first interested in doing what we had been doing for a while with, with the stern ending behavior in these pieces. So we wanted to know whether uh, there was any intergroup variation in non-conceptive sex in female Japanese macaques. And if so, whether this uh, variation could be explained in terms of cultural processes. Because again, we had in mind that uh, some of these non-conceptive sexual behaviors could include uh, both adaptations and byproducts, particularly uh, because, um, particularly if, if they were uh, uh, culturally underlined, which is basically the, the thread of my entire talk today. 
so the, the short answer to this question is is yes uh, one piece of evidence to support the the cultural nature of non-conceptive sex female mounting behavior in japanese macaques is that uh, female female mounting postures are uh, population specific so here on these uh, these photos um, one can see that uh, we have five examples of uh, female female mounting postures that are characteristic of the Arashiyama group of Japanese macaques. And um, even though genetic explanations cannot be ruled out, uh, we suggested that arbitrary behavior patterns such as intergroup differences in, in female mounting postures uh, could be purely cultural because there's, uh, I mean, any alternative explanation is, is difficult to imagine. And, and more theoretically, um, Evasi proposed that in Japanese macaques, female female mounting behavior and female male mounting behavior are non-conceptive sexual behaviors that are functionally and evolutionarily linked with female female mounting being the evolutionary byproduct of a hypothesized behavioral adaptation which would be female male mounting now let's provide some detail on each of these hypotheses so on the one hand uh, the adaptation hypothesis holds that female male mounting is a, a special courtship behavior or super sexual solicitation that serves the function of focusing the male's attention preventing him from moving away and expediting male female mounting in the context of high female competition for male mates uh, and on the other hand the, the the byproduct hypothesis holds that female female mounting uh, would have evolved as a fitness neutral spandrel of selection for female male mounting with a potential proximate benefit called utility or, or bonus so if you remember um, Marta Linde Melina's extended taxonomy of, of non-fitness that uh, I mentioned earlier in the presentation and in this case the the utility the bonus would be that females obtain sexual reward during mounts well of course we didn't just leave these hypotheses to rest, we went on and tested them. So first is female male mounting a behavioral adaptation that takes the form of uh, a super sexual solicitation triggering male female mounting. And, and Noel took the lead on, on this study with this uh, paper titled Is Female Male Mounting Functional? An Analysis of the Temporal Patterns of Sexual Behaviors in Japanese Macaques. So number one, we looked at the sequence or the order of expression of um, different female to male sexual solicitations, such as uh, glancing, uh, hindquarter uh, presentation, body spasm, ground smacking, sex calling, grasping, pushing, but also female male mounting. In other words, all these types of behaviors that a female Japanese macaque can perform to prompt the male to mount her during a concert ship because you have to imagine uh, the situation here even though a, a male and, and an astrous female may be sitting next to each other as a mating couple for some time there are also plenty of uh, other astrous female competitors during the mating season and the males are attracted to them so a given female should do her best to retain her male and make sure that she gets inseminated while uh, she is in heat by actually uh, making the best use of this uh, range of sexual solicitation in her behavioral repertoire and so we found that um, female male mounting was performed significantly more after repeated glancing sex calling hindquarter uh, presentation and 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 body spasm and, and this behavior, female male mounting, uh, mounting, tended to be expressed when these and other sexual solicitations had failed to prompt male female mounting.
So our results indicated that um, female male mounting could be this last resort female to male sexual solicitation. Number two, with some essential help from Maurizio Casarubia again, uh, we used a T-pattern analysis and, and we found that uh, mating sequences with um, female male mounting exhibited a lower level of repeatability in the expression of, of sexual solicitations than uh, mating sequences without uh, female uh, male mounting and this was measured by the mean number of recurring series of behavior patterns or the mean occurrence of each uh, T pattern detected. In other words, uh, the temporal organization of heterosexual mating sequences with female male mounting, that is the hypothesized adaptation, showed more structural signatures of functional constraints than that of heterosexual mating sequences without female male mounting. So that's another example of how using a structural analysis of behavior can inform us about uh, behavioral function and behavioral evolution. And number three, we found that heterosexual mating sequences, including female male mounting, ended more often with uh, male-female mounting followed by ejaculation than those sequences without female-male mounting. Well, taken together, these results provided support to the view that female-male mounting is a behavioral adaptation whose function is to prompt male-female mounting for reproductive outcome. Now, did we find any evidence to support the view that female-female mounting could be a behavioral byproduct of this uh, female-male mounting adaptation? And the answer is yes, we did. But before looking at this uh, evolutionary uh, transformation in this specific direction from adaptation to byproduct through uh, neutral drift, let's start by asking ourselves whether uh, these uh, two forms of female mounting behaviors are actually um, evolutionarily and developmentally related. And again, our approach to this ultimate question was to examine some possible proximate causes. So number one, Paul and I co-supervised a master's student, Lydia, and we worked in collaboration with Sergio Pellis again, and together we did a, a similar comparative structural analysis to what I mentioned earlier for stone pounding and nut pounding behavior, this eschol walkman movement notation technique, but this time we applied it to compare uh, the structure of uh, female male mounting and female female mounting. And uh, we found uh, no uh, significant differences in the kinematic structure of these two forms of female mounting behavior, which indicates that uh, female male mounting and female female mounting are evolutionarily and developmentally related. Number two, we went back to our intergroup comparative approach and we tested the female mounting covariation hypothesis, which led to two predictions. First, if female male mounting and female female mounting are linked in their evolution and development, then the frequency and the form of these two types of female mounting behavior should co-vary across groups of Japanese macaques. And our intergroup comparative study supported this prediction. As you can see from this um, overall matching of the, the frequency colors, in the, the two parts of this uh, disc here, with uh, the left part being female male mounting and the, the right part being uh, female female mounting. And, and with regards to the form, uh, we found that groups exhibiting high levels of structurally diverse female male mounting also exhibited high levels of structurally diverse female female mounting and vice versa. Second prediction related this time to the unidirectional hypothesized relationship. Um, if 
female female mounting in Japanese macaques is a neutral evolutionary byproduct of female male mounting, then female male mounting should be phylogenetically more ancestral than female female mounting. So logically, from an evolutionary history standpoint, um, we, we might find groups with um, female male mounting and no female female mounting like this disc. Uh, but we should not find groups with female female mounting and no female male mounting like um, this kind of disc. And, and, and again, our intergroup comparative study supported this prediction, as you can see from this figure. So overall, our results um, using proximate level type of methods were consistent with the, the female mounting covariation hypothesis and strongly suggested that female female mounting is a behavioral byproduct of the female male mounting adaptation. And to complete this uh, analysis, you may remember that um, the byproduct hypothesis included a proximate potential utility or bonus um, that when uh, mounting same sex partners, females could obtain sexual reward. Well, I won't have time to go into the detail of this last study, but Paul Vasey and his colleagues, including Afra Forud, used once again a structural analysis focusing on body postures and limb movement and found that um, pelvic thrusting and, and tail movements during mounts were uh, strong indications that female female mounting was positively reinforced by pleasurable feedback through genital stimulation. So to put it simply, there would be a, a hedonic component to this behavioral byproduct, female-female mounting, which may have facilitated its emergence and maintenance during evolution. Well, that's it. As you can see, our, our collaborative research uh, effort led us to provide solid evidence in support of both the adaptation hypothesis uh, for female male mounting and the byproduct hypothesis for female female mounting and in support of uh, an evolutionary link between these two behaviors. So to conclude, let me return to my uh, talk title, Studying Behavioral Byproducts in Primatology. Maybe this title was a bit enigmatic for some of you at the beginning, but I hope that this presentation helped uh, clarify a few things. So first, who studies behavioral byproducts in primatology, really? Well, in, in the 17th century, Moliere wrote a play about this Borgia gentleman who, who was a would-be novel aspiring to uh, climb the social ladder by adopting a range of uh, bourgeois attitudes, uh, including, according to his philosophy master, uh, speaking prose. And, and Mr. Jourdain, that's the name of the, the, the bourgeois gentleman, was so happy to realize that, well, what do you know about that? These 40 years now, I've been speaking in prose without even knowing it. So uh, my point here is that, and, and by the way, there's nothing offensive about that. Uh, just like Mr. Jourdain, most primatologists who study behaviors actually study behavioral byproducts and sometimes without even realizing it. And, and there's nothing surprising about that. Uh, if we return to this extended taxonomy of non-fitness, you have uh, adaptations here and everything else is, is pretty much uh, evolutionary byproducts. And, and, and because this taxonomy was um, not specifically created for uh, behavioral phenotypes, maybe we won't find a, a perfect example of behavior for each uh, category of, of byproducts, but at least it gives you an idea of the diversity of uh, byproducts that are potentially out there. Second, how do we study behavioral byproducts in primatology? Well, I, I won't give you the, the general recipe, but throughout my talk today, I did provide some elements of answer to this question. And my main approach here was to remind you that um, the, the structure function interface um, applied to, to the behavioral domain um, has a huge heuristic power 
um, as reflected in, in this statement by Pelis and Pelis in this book on animal play by Beckhoff and, and Byers. Therefore, behavioral description informs functional inference, which in turn influences further description. In other words, detailed knowledge about proximate causes and particularly behavioral structure and mechanisms largely contributes to testing hypotheses about ultimate causes and particularly behavioral function and evolution. Now, to put all this visually, um, here we have the, the structure function interface with one informing the other and vice versa. A and we used a, a series of structural analysis of behavior including the eschkol walkman movement notation, the Laban movement analysis, the T-pattern analysis, and the intergroup comparative analysis as ways to explore the evolutionary relationships between behavioral adaptations and their byproducts, some of these uh, relationships being based on exaptive emergence, whereas others were based on neutral drift. So one last time, why um, is it important to study behavioral byproducts in primatology and shed light on, on some of these too often neglected um, evolutionary outcomes? Well, because behavioral byproducts are uh, part and parcel of uh, evolutionary history and evolutionary processes. And, and there are connections between behavioral byproducts and behavioral adaptations. Uh, for example, we found that um, stone handling as a behavioral byproduct may play a role in the exaptive emergence of stone tool use adaptations. And and female female mounting may be a neutral evolutionary byproduct of the female male mounting adaptation. And these two functionless uh, behaviors down there uh, can persist over uh, evolutionary time because they are maintained approximately through cultural enhancement and pleasurable feedback. Indeed, this is play and this is sex. And adaptations and byproducts are really two sides of the same evolutionary coin. Uh, now, to finish on a slightly lighter note, when, when Arijit invited me to participate in this uh, talk series, uh, he asked me to come up with a tentative title for my talk. And, and really, the first thing that came to mind was not studying behavioral byproducts in primatology. I, I thought no one would like to listen to such an obscure and apparently boring topic. Uh, so I thought, mm, why not? catch the audience's attention with something like sex, money, and, and rock and roll. Sex, because I was already planning to include our, our research project on non-conceptive sex. Money, because I was initially planning to talk about another research project conducted in my lab, but I couldn't easily fit it, uh, it into this, this talk today. So uh, if you dare inviting me for a second time, um, I'll, I'll talk about token economy and, and bartering behavior in, in Balinese long tailed macaques and, and rock and roll because, well, I believe sternling is, is just this rock and roll behavior. And, and here's, a, here's a hint about that. How about that for rock and roll, eh? Uh, now, um, I'm extremely grateful to the funding agencies and sponsors who generously contributed and, and are still contributing to um, support my research, both um, during my postdoc years and, and now during my, my faculty years. Uh, and last but not least, uh, a huge thank you to my colleagues and collaborators who made this research uh, possible. So I'm going to name them uh, all by their first names. Um, Elsa, Maurizio, Afra, Noel, Mike, Mikel, Charmely, Sergio, Rana, Paul, Hugh Hugh, also known as Cookie, Rob, and, and Pak Wanya. And, and a, a special thank you to Noel, my wife and 
a research partner for 25 years, so we've been through all the, the ups and downs of field work together, but apparently we're, we're still there. And, and of course, uh, my, my current and, and former lab members, my postdocs, grad students, and our invaluable research assistants, without whom none of this would be uh, possible. So Fanny, Harijit, Camilla, Sydney, Valeria, Lydia, Amanda, Caleb, Bess, Christian, Matt, Anna, Lucia, Sidesh, Nora, Laila, Silvana, Yanni, and Chloe. And thank you again to the Association of Indian Primatologists for giving me the opportunity to speak with you today. And I really apologize. I'm sure I went way over time and I do hope there's still time left for some questions. That was a lovely talk, JB. Thank you so much. So uh, okay. there are few comments that I would like to begin with before we move on yes. to the questions. Um, Matt Wisdom seemed to be super interested and super excited about the talk. So this comment came right at the beginning. He is okay. uh, he's a, a Paleolithic archaeologist and has worked on stone uh, tool technology in South Africa. Uh -huh. um, in experimental mapping, looking at social learning, people are much more likely to be able to make tools when directed verbally rather than merely coping someone else. Do you have any uh, reply to this comment? That is very interesting. Um, I, I, not not directly. I, I won't have a direct answer to this um, to this question. The only example I, I would refer to again is is our field experiments um, about about the stone plate behavior, in which we found that uh, these these behavioral artifacts, these these piles of stones, play a key role in the social transmission of not stone tool use or stone tool making uh, behavior, but but stone play behavior. In other words, when your when your behavioral landscape is filled with uh, behavioral artifacts, physical traces left by um, previous performers, some of them being skilled performers, and they know how to do the thing, they know how to play with stones, they know how to use the stones as tool, and they leave behind these. Um, these uh, physical traces in, in their environment, then individuals are more likely to, to use these behavioral artifacts as, as easier starting points to get them to, you know, tinker, again, I'm back to this term, tinker around um, with, with, with these uh, objects. So I'm not sure I answered directly this question. I'm, just as I'm not a neuroscientist or a linguist, I'm, I'm not, um, I'm not a field archaeologist, so I'm afraid um, I, I don't know all the details of, of the, the study that um, this person is, is mentioning. Uh, if Matt is still uh, watching you, I hope he sends in a reply. Uh, he has more. Great. He has more comments. I'll okay. I'll check. Okay. Um, in experimental napping, looking at social learning, people are much more likely to be able to make tools when directed verbally rather than merely coping someone else. So that's his comment. Yes. That's, <laughs> and that, that's, that's the, yes. Oh, that, oh, that's the same so, thing. Oh, sorry. So sorry. I see. Yes, that, uh, that's what you asked me first. Yes. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Uh, All it's right. also interesting. Thing, evolutionary observation that um, as hand axes appear in the archaeological record at the same uh -huh. time we see a marked increase in brain size in homo yes. ergas yes uh, so it seems to me that a form of language must have existed around that time for those tools to be consisting consistently replicated Yes, something I did not mention, well, I, I briefly alluded to it, is, is the role of teaching. Well, I, I did mention uh, instructional learning. So, um, as, as mentioned in, in the comment, yes, there is, I, I've read many papers about this, uh, this mutually beneficial package, the, this, this triad of traits, stone tool making, 
or the beginning of it, language or the beginning of it, and teaching or the beginning of it. And, and basically you could picture the scenario where our human ancestors were sitting around the, the firing place and, and they were chipping away at rocks, possibly starting to make tools. And one way to make this behavior more prevalent within the group is not only through observations, but through basic uh, verbal instruction. So that doesn't mean complex elaborated language the way, the way we have now, but, but the, the first basic ingredient. And again, that takes place within the teaching context. And, and this is reflected in, in parts of our brain. Yes, absolutely. I remember reading papers about that. That's, that's a very interesting question. Interesting. So we have, uh, he wants, okay, Badrinath uh, Dore Rajan, Dore Rajan, well, he wants to know if you could converse about uh, tool making implies language capability. Does tool making imply on language capability? I, I guess that's what he's trying to ask. Um, I, um, I, I did not imply that. And when I said, this story is, is a kind of a chicken and egg story. <laughs> it's that, again, you have to remember that I'm, I'm not an expert. I used extensively this example at the beginning of my talk, but I'm, I'm not a linguist, I'm not, I'm not an archeologist and a neuroscientist, so you have to keep this in mind. But um, from the, the, the literature that I've explored, um, we, we don't really know what, what appeared first, whether it was the basics of um, verbal communication or the, 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 the core ingredients of stone tool making. What we know is that the brain has the exaptive capability to um, have these two processes function in tandem. And, and they could reinforce each other, they could have reinforced each other um, during um, the evolution of our brains. I guess, I guess that was my point. And, and I remember talking about this when I presented uh, the, the talk in the modern language department. Um, a, a linguist told me it, it is a great hypothesis, but as far as I know, it has not re it has not been backed up by a lot of evidence and i replied to that well as far as i know there is evidence from neuroscience there is evidence from cognitive psychology and there is evidence from well field archaeology as as the first person was um, um commenting on and and these at least these three different fields converge um, and, and tend to point at an evolutionary scenario in which language and stone tool making could have co-evolved. Hmm. So again, I'm, I'm kind of running in circle here because I, I basically don't have the answer. And I don't think it's important to, to really explore um, what, what occurred first, because to me, the most important part is that these two processes, regardless of which one uh, appeared first, these two processes reinforced each other. One paved the way for the other and, and vice versa. Nice. Uh, our next question is from Amish Dua. Can we try to explain music and language in humans in a similar context? Oh my goodness! Uh, well, <laughs> a little bit out of my field of expertise, but yeah, I, I, I asked for it. I asked for it through my talk, so it's it's fair game. Um, again, I remember reading papers about the evolutionary origins of of music. Drumming, drumming is is one of the the behavioral component, the the core. Uh, aspects of, of music, rhythm, rhythmic activities. And there are many papers, by the way, uh, in the, in the non-human primate literature uh, that argued that um, percussive, um, object-assisted percussive behavior uh, performed by, by non-human primates um, could be looked as, as um, as an evolutionary homologue or analog 
of um, of the very first uh, roots of um, musical behavior in in our human ancestors. So, uh, music could have started with uh, picking up a rock and and pounding it on the on the wall of the cave and and in in a rhythmic fashion. So, <clears throat> the the video that I played uh, in in the last slide about that this Japanese this Japanese macaque in the captive troop um, in the, in the Primate Research Institute is is a is a little bit of a of a a wink to to this idea that you know it it could have started with with play behavior because as I argued in my talk play behavior is a reservoir of behavioral variability and and that's that's key it's a pool of behavioral variance from which a population that has maintained culturally this play behavior can draw from and and then uh, possibly transform that co-opt these behaviors into um, behaviors that could have a benefit they might not have a function they might not be adaptations because they did not evolve originally to serve this function, but they could have um, benefits further down the road. So again, play, uh, percussive actions, and and music could have um, could have co-evolved. But uh, there are experts in the field that uh, might be able to confirm or or not um, what, what I'm what I'm saying here. Okay, so uh, the our next question is from Omar Pati, sir. He is a scientist at CCMB who has worked extensively for decades on primate genetics and endocrinology. So he, mm -hmm. he wants to know if there is any learning by other members of the group on tool using. Um, that's a very good question that um, we should ask my PhD students. So. Camilla, will, Camilla Cheney will be looking at um, the social learning aspect of the use of stones as tools in these um, field experiments that I mentioned, the, the, the puzzle boxes. So part of her data analysis will consist in testing whether there would have been an inventor, uh, an individual coming up with, with the tool use solution in, in this um, foraging context, experimentally induced, but foraging context. And, and then she will look at whether this, um, this stone tool use behavior um, spread socially. But, but the main angle that we're actually taking with, with this uh, project, this field experiment project, is not only whether individuals can learn socially tool use, but also whether they can learn individually how to generate a tool use solution to a new problem because individually they have this range of stone play actions, like a stone handling profile that is very unique to each individual that would have prepared them through affordance learning to generate given appropriate conditions, which is what we are giving them, a puzzle box, the possibility to, you know, possibility for actions, the possibility to generate these tool use actions, can they do it on their own? In other words, the, the basic prediction here is that individuals who are experts in the stone pounding behavior in a playful context should be the ones who come up with the stone tool use solution the earliest because again they have in their own individual behavioral repertoire the, um, the possibility to pick up a stone and, and pound it on the surface. They do it in a playful context, can they do it in a, in a functional, in a tool use context? So again, um, we'll be looking at um, learning individually and learning socially. But but to finish my answer to this question, we actually published a, a paper that I mentioned in my talk about the stone throwing behavior 
in which here the, the evidence is, I would say, rather anecdotal. But um, Noel, Charmali, Mike, Rizaldi, and I combined our data sets uh, on on a troop, a captive groups of a uh, captive group of, of Japanese macaques at the PRI Primate Research Institute, and we were able to trace back the the probable uh, emergence invention of the stone throwing behavior in this group, and we found that within a matter of weeks, couple of months, the behavior that had never been performed by any group member any group members before because we had observation um, like um, previous observations this behavior originated from one individual and then spread socially so again that's an example of social learning uh, of, of tool use wow <laughs> uh, okay so i'm gonna move on Ram wanted to know, are there individual variations in female, male, male, and female, female behavior within a group? If yes, how do you explain it? Uh, female, male, and female, female, female behavior. Male. I, I, guess, I guess he means mounting behavior, correct? Yes, yes. Yes. Well, oh, we, we haven't... Mounting, female, female, mounting. Sorry. Got it. Yes. Um, we we haven't fully explored uh, this part of our data set, but um, off the top of my head, <laughs> for having spent hours and hours video recording these behaviors, um, it it is it is possible. It is possible that um, some females have. Um, now, I'm, I'm going to ask you to specify the question even further. Um, does Dr. Ram mean um, the, the expression, the, the expression of the behavior or itself of the mounting behavior or the form, the, the posture of the mount? Uh, Ram, can you can you ask, be specific? I mean, he will just maybe type it here so I can ask, sir. Okay, he says he means only the behavior. The behavior, okay. The mountain so, behavior. Yeah, the answer to this question is, at least in the group that we, we studied most um, extensively, which is the Arashiyama um, free-ranging groups of, uh, free-ranging group of Japanese macaques, um, the answer is uh, most adult females in this group engaged in some form of non-conceptive sex, whether it was female male mounting or female female mounting. What, what did vary is, is the frequency at which um, they engaged in, in, this, in, this, in these mounting behaviors. Um, but overall, we found that a huge, huge majority of these females performed either female female or female male mounting. And generally, those females who engaged in female female mounting also engaged in female male mounting. So I hope this this answers his question. Ram, I, I guess it answered his questions because he's not sent in any following question. Uh, we, 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 ac that we actually, we we actually. Um, drafted a manuscript which which is still in my my drawers somewhere about um, about a Kinsey scale in in these uh, female monkeys so Kinsey scale basically tells you that you're going to look at the, at the sexual orientation of, of these monkeys I want to be very cautious with sexual orientation here we're not talking about the same kind of orientation as as in humans of course but we're using um, sexual mounting behavior and solicitation to to back up our claim and and we found that these females in in Arashiyama they range across the spectrum in in the in the Kinsey scale from those females that are uh, exclusively heterosexual and there are actually very very few of them to those females who rate Kinsey scale Kinsey 5 on, on the scale. In other words, they are almost exclusively engaging in 
homosexual behavior. And the huge majority of, of the females actually um, rank in the middle of, of, the, of the spectrum. They are Kinsey two, three, four. That means they are, they are mainly bisexual. They have sexual interactions with both males and females. Wow, interesting. Okay, <laughs> so uh, Agus Jati, he he loves your talk. He finds it very interesting, and this is the first time he learned the concept of adaptations and byproducts behavior. Unfortunately, oh, <laughs> uh, unfortunately, he didn't have you didn't have time to talk about the monkey business behavior that he's interested in. That is right. Uh, you would have to invite me again. I, <laughs> sure, that gives us an opportunity. I, <laughs> I already went way over time, so there was no way I could squeeze the the token economy, the bottom stuff. Another talk, in there. so you have the topic yes. for the next talk. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's ready because I'm 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 presenting it at the the online animal behavior society conference later this week. So, oh wow, that's. That's nice. So we will have you again for another talk. Uh, Badrinath uh, Dure Rajan, he has another question. He is thanking you for the answer that you gave him for his previous question. Um, okay. he, his next question is, scoping action itself is green of uh, green beard effect to increase fitness with acceptance into the social structure of the group? Oh, my goodness. Um, I'm afraid I... I, I will not know how to handle this one. Could, could it be possible to put this question into context? Because it, it, sounds, it sounds very theoretical. Mm -hmm. So could, could we take one example from elements from my talk that I could use to possibly answer the, the green beard question? I think you can do that. Uh... Yeah, I think you can go ahead and do that. But Drinath has not sent a follow-up question. Okay. Uh, should I move on to the next question? Sure. Okay. So, um, Alexandra Pascual Garrido. Could stone handling in Japanese macaques and stone tool use in long-tail macaques be evolutionary related? Stone handling in Japanese macaques and stone tool use in in Balinese macaques. Long tail macaques. In, in long, long tail macaques. Long tail macaques. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, yes, to to some extent, they 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 could be. I mean, it's it's all about object manipulation. One is in a playful context. The other one is in a in a functional context. And we're talking about two two different species here. But, but the interesting thing is that we could actually test this in each of these two species. In other words, is stone handling related to tool use in Japanese macaques? And then is stone handling somehow related to uh, stone tool used in, in Balinese macaques? And um, a, a slide that I didn't have time to present is that ultimately, um, we'd like to take uh, a broad cross-species comparative approach to stone handling and stone tool use. Someone I didn't mention in my talk is um, Michael Gummert. As, as you may know, Michael Gummert has been studying stone tool use in a foraging context in, um, in long-tail macaques, a Burmese long-tail macaques for many, many years. And we, we talked many times at, at conferences about the possibility to, to put our data sets together to try and, and get a comprehensive picture of how um, stone handling and stone tool use um, could, be, could be further evolutionarily, functionally, proximately related um, I remember her, her um, Michael's um, PhD student published a paper um, arguing about the link between, between stone handling and stone tool use. The thing is, 
when when I talked with um, Amanda Tan, that's her name, and and Michael Gumert, they both told me that the long-tail macaques uh, of of the coast of Thailand who use stones as tools, they don't engage in stone handling. So we we have we have this this odd puzzle here, where um, our Balinese long-tail macaques engage in stone handling, but spontaneously they don't engage in stone tool use. And we have the long-tail macaques in Thailand that engage in stone tool use and don't seem to engage in stone handling. So that's pretty much a dent to my um, my hypothesis here and, and, uh, and the core of my talk. But I think that's that's what makes research interesting is that uh, when it doesn't work, you want to try and understand why it doesn't work. In other words, it could be that um, there are specific conditions that are conducive to stone play being co-opted into stone tool use. And maybe it's only in those specific conditions that um, that we have this link. And, and maybe macaques can invent stone tool use without having ever played with stones. Of course, that's 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 a possibility that makes the study even more interesting then do you have more uh, time for taking more questions there's there are a few more questions uh, can i just continue I do. do you have time? i do oh, absolutely okay. yes <laughs> okay so uh, alexandra has an um a uh, follow-up uh, question. If you can prove that stone handling has a function, for example, stress release, could stone mm -hmm. handling be functional and considered a behavioral adaptation? Um, well, the strict definition of, um, of a behavioral adaptation, which I, I did not mention here, is that for stone handling to be a behavioral adaptation, uh, it it should have been selected originally to serve a certain a certain um, consequence purpose that we call a function so only adaptations have functions and as far as we know stone handling has no function it might have effects it might have benefits for example it could lead to, yes, a, a decrease in, in stress levels. Uh, it could facilitate uh, social cohesion. But as far as we know, um, that might not be the original um, reason, the original function for which, for which um, stone handling emerged. That's why I have put um, stone handling in in the byproduct uh, category in my talk, and until um, we someone can demonstrate that the original function of stone handling is this thing, and until that, I will not call stone handling an adaptation. It's it's a it's probably a byproduct of of other. Um, mental adaptations or or, or, or or cognitive processes that could be adaptations but that led to this behavior as as a as a byproduct interesting uh, okay so Nin ninja's question is divided into three parts i'm just going to go one by one and then you can answer at the end um, mm -hmm. I'm near a population of wild Barbary macaques that exhibit a very specific male male mounting. I was thinking that it may serve to mark dominance or something, but I can't explain some aspect of this behavior. What do you think about it? Can oh, human yes. macaque social learning occur? Yeah. Should. Y yes. So, same sex mounting behavior has been uh, reported in the primate literature extensively male mounting males females mounting females so that's same sex mounting behavior but we we've known for a long time that um, many probably most of these same sex mounting behavior are actually not sexual 
they are sociosexual. In other words, they are they are sexual in structure, in their form, its amount, but they are social in their function. They serve the function of um, regulating uh, social dominance interactions, for example. So in, in males, it's, it's, it's quite uh, well documented in, in many uh, primate species, including macaques, that um, male, uh, males occasionally mount each other as, as a way to signal um, differences in, in hierarchical ranks. So in other words, we, we're dealing with, with a sociosexual behavior rather than, than a, than a same-sex sexual behavior. What I mentioned in my talk are really behaviors, mounts, that are sexual in nature. They are not sociosexual. Paul Vasey has been um, testing um, sociosexual hypothesis for female female mounting for many years and he has not found a single piece of evidence that would uh, support the hypothesis that female female mounting behavior in Japanese macaques is sociosexual it's it's really it's really it's really sexual in nature that's why I called it non-conceptive sex Interesting. Uh, Kemila Cheni, she wanted to answer Dr. Umapati's uh, question. So he, she's like to go Thanks, back to Camilla. the question. <laughs> Is there any learning by other members of the group on tool using when looking at the context of expression of tap on groin, this form of tool assisted masturbation? We found that it was preferentially expressed in a sexual context, exactly what you said, uh, which could validate its sexual nature, but also in the presence of other individuals performing stool play, uh, stone play behavior around. So the performance of uh, TOG, I don't know what TOG stands tap on for. Groin. <laughs> okay, tap on groin, in the presence of others could facilitate its spreading in the population and possibly possible facilitate learning in others of its arguably adaptive form of tool use stone tool use yes <laughs> yes absolutely thanks camila yeah thank you thank you very much sir i guess uh, that's all the questions uh, if people have more questions please feel free to write to uh, jb lika he would be more than happy to answer your questions uh, I would like to ask Tithar to come online right now. Uh, assuming there are no more, hi, hi. So assuming there are no more questions, uh, we would like to offer a vote of thanks to Dr. J.P. Nika. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for your precious time. And it was indeed a very insightful talk. Uh, and I'd also like to thank all the audience from YouTube and Facebook and for all the interesting questions. Uh, and we also have an announcement to make. So there are a series of talks lined up. Our next talk is on 31st of July at 10 a.m. in the morning by Dr. Goro Hania, who is an associate professor at the Primate Research Institute, Kaiju University, Japan. He will be discussing the difference in the patterns of seasonal fluctuations in food availability in the two extreme habitats and how primates cope with the seasonality to survive them. Uh, so uh, that was it. And uh, JB, would you like to add something as an ending note or something? I would like to thank you again, yeah. everyone from, from the association for this opportunity. That, that was really nice and it was my pleasure.